the Philistines, and we showed the grave site that was in uh, Ashkelon. And I think that was pretty neat because it's, uh, that, that grave site was found in the 1980s, and that was the first physical evidence that the Philistines actually existed. Um, and it gives us great insight as to where they originated from. Uh, they're doing DNA samples on, uh, on, on the uh, bone material uh, that they found, and so they, they will likely be able to trace uh, with a pretty high degree of accuracy uh, where the Philistines originated from. Uh, the Bible gave us some clues, uh, but I think it'll be pretty neat to have DNA testing that uh, actually verifies that. Um, I showed you the grave sites. My, my daughter Eden was watching last week, and she was asking me about, um, about some of the grave sites and some of the customs and uh, why they broke pottery and, and created blankets over the children. And uh, the short answer is we don't really know. Um, we don't have any, uh, any text that shows us why the Philistines did that, why that was their custom. So our best guess is that uh, it had something to do with religion and maybe appeasing the gods. Uh, but yeah, the short answer is we don't really know. But it is interesting that uh, all of the infants that were buried at this grave site uh, were covered very consistently with broken pottery. Uh, so for whatever reason, they created a blanket around them. So we, we also talked about how the Philistines were, were dreaded by the people because they were just ruthless. Uh, they were absolutely terrifying people. They were some of the first uh, to shift from bronze to iron. Uh, so they were forging weapons made out of iron while the rest of the world was uh, still using bronze, or most of the world was using bronze. Uh, so as far as military power, they were advanced above uh, everybody else in the world. So not only did they have a military advantage, uh, they, uh, they were really tall people. Uh, we showed you the grave sites last week, and you could see the bones. Um, they, were, they were just big people. They were literally big boned. Um, and so it's not really a big surprise whenever we see Goliath uh, show up out of nowhere and he's this big giant and people fear him. So that's going to be the story that we talk about today. And what I don't want to see happen is what happens often where we tell the story as if Goliath was this, um, this anomaly, uh, you know, this freak of nature. And that's why the Israelites were terrified of him. Uh, Goliath is not why the Israelites were terrified. If you remember, previous to Goliath, uh, you had the period of the judges, and you had Samson, who had all these interactions with the Philistines. Uh, he had one who was, was a Philistine wife. Uh, she was murdered. She was burned to death, uh, along with her father, by other Philistines. Um, you had the prostitute, the Philistine prostitute that Samson uh, had an interaction with. And then you had another one named Delilah, who was also a Philistine. And uh, eventually the Philistines surrounded uh, Samson and, of course, you know, blinded him. And they were just really, really ruthless. And then his last feat of strength uh, is whenever he pulled the, uh, the Philistine uh, temple down. And what's interesting is with archaeology, I didn't show any slides of this, but um, we found Philistine temples that were exactly as described in the scriptures. They had these big beams, um, these, I think they were cedar beams, uh, and there was a big cedar beam that came across the top. So, you know, the same description that we have in scripture, uh, we, we found that in these Philistine cities. So we know that they existed. Uh, we know that the Philistines were powerful. They were ruthless. Uh, they were mean. Uh, they, they didn't discriminate. They killed their own people. And uh, I think that's really important because it verifies uh, the scriptural account. So uh, we're going to look, we have some slides for you for, uh, for this scripture that we're going to look at in 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, starting in verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Succo which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Succo and Azekah uh, in Ephes-Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered, 
and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on, on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goli uh, Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Uh, so just over nine feet tall. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. So there you have your reference to the iron. Uh, part of his, uh, his getup was made of bronze, and part of it was iron. And his shield bearer went before him. Verse 8, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a reason why the Israelites were terrified. So it wasn't just Goliath shouting insults against Israel. It wasn't just Goliath who they were afraid of. Um, there was so much at stake with this battle. And if you remember from the days of Samson, uh, the Philistines were really good at doing these uh, challenges, these dares. Uh, they, would, they would kind of coax people, and they would dare them, and they would challenge them to, to uh, certain events and certain intellectual challenges. And if you failed, uh, like in the case of Samson's first wife, uh, they would burn you and your family. They were absolutely ruthless people. So here you have the Philistine military gathered against the Israelite military, and you have a direct challenge from one of their, uh, one of their chief uh, people of war. You have Goliath, who's not only a physical giant, um, he's really significant to the Philistine uh, military. So he comes out, he issues this challenge, and he says, you need to send somebody over here and fight me. And if that person wins, we'll be your servants. And if we, uh, if we win, you're going to be our servants. So there's a reason why King Saul was terrified. You know, it, and it's not like you negotiate with these people. I always think this is interesting because, you know, I, I know people who are pacifists. Um, and, I, and I'm not judging people who are pacifists. Um, but, you know, I have friends who get into debates with other people and they talk about why they're a pacifist, uh, why they think it's wrong to go to war against other nations, why we should do peace agreements and you know, always try to work uh, through negotiations. And then we have other people who are on the other side and you know, they say, hey, we need to use our military and, uh, and we, need, we need to exert force on other nations uh, to keep peace. So those are basically two sides of, um, of probably two different coins. And some of the arguments from the pacifist side is that uh, all people are made in the image of God, and so it, it's wrong uh, to go in to, and to kill people. You should always try to negotiate and, and you know, establish peace if and when you can. And so I, I look at the scriptures... And certainly God didn't tell the Israelites to have these peace agreements. Um, in some cases he did, but in other cases he told them to go to war. Well, why is that? Uh, if you look at the human nature, the human soul, the human mind, uh, there are some people who, they, they oppress people because they want to. Um, they're ruthless, uh, they're godless, uh, they're, they're mean, they're nasty, they're violent. And they will always be that way. Um, there are people who are in prison right now that if you release them today, they will murder somebody today. Um, 
there is no peace in them. So, you know, you look at some of your leaders of other nations, um, you're not going to solve problems with hugs. <laughs> um, you, you know, they, they just don't negotiate well uh, because they don't care. They're ruthless. They like blood. They like uh, defeating people. They like starting wars. Uh, if you look at the leader of North Korea, there's a prime example. He likes taunting people. He likes death. He likes oppression. He does it to his own people. Uh, they have a major starvation issue in North Korea uh, because their leader doesn't care. He really doesn't care. If you look at Iran, uh, they really don't care. Um, so trying to come up with peace agreements with people, sure, that should always be your first, uh, your first bet, if and when you can do it. Absolutely, you should try to avoid war when you can. But there are some people, and the Philistines are included in that, where they're not going to do peace agreements. Um, it's just not going to happen. So what does God tell the Israelites? Uh, well, way back in the, in the period of the judges, God tells the Israelites that they're going to go up against the Philistines in war and they're going to prevail. Uh, so now fast forward to the time of, of the kings. There's so much at stake whenever... Uh, this battle happened between Goliath and whoever the challenger was. Well, we know from Scripture that David uh, was the one who came up. Uh, this isn't on the slides, but I'm going to go ahead and read, uh, starting in verse 12 of 1 Samuel 17. Now David was the son of uh, an Aphrathite of Bethlehem and Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were uh, Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. So I want you to get this picture in your mind. It's not like Goliath came out and, and challenged him one time and was just kind of laughing and he was this big, mean bully. Uh, for 40 days, he's coming out day after day and he's ramping up this, um, th this military that's on his side. So the Philistines are getting energized while the Israelites on the other side are, are getting intimidated and they're kind of backing down. Um, this is what the Philistines did. You know, it's not like they just went out and they were ruthless and they killed people. They taunted people. They liked it. They liked to taunt people. They liked to make people live in fear. Uh, even the Egyptians, as we mentioned last week, were terrified of the Philistines. Egypt was the dominant world power for years and years and years. They were ruthless. And they were scared of the Philistines. Uh, we've uncovered writings in Egypt... Um, where the Egyptians talk about the people of the sea, the sea peoples. Uh, and it was this group of people who lived along the sea on certain cities. And we certainly know that the Philistines were included in that. Uh, but we don't know how many other people may have been included in that. But we know for sure the Egyptians are talking about the Philistines. They were terrified of them. The Philistines were absolutely ruthless. So if you have your dominant world power who's terrified of the Philistines, imagine the Israelites who lived under Egyptian slavery for years, and now they're the, this small remnant uh, who's living in Canaan now, among the other Canaanites, and the Philistines are living among them. Imagine how scared they were. You know, Israel was not this dominant world power at the time. Um, they were just this little bitty nation of maybe a couple million people, maybe a few million people. And the Philistines had a major advantage over them. Um, and as I mentioned, it wasn't until 600 BC that the Philistines were finally wiped out um, and, and kind of brought to their knees. So from 1200 BC to 600 BC, the Philistines just ran roughshod all, all over the world. Um, so the Israelites had good, good reason to be scared. 
Uh, verse 17. By the way, David, uh, little young David, would have known this. It's not like the Philistines came out of nowhere and, you know, David's like, you know, oh, go fight Goliath. Um, they, they knew who the Philistines were because they were living with them. They were terrified of them. Uh, verse 17, and Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these 10 che uh, cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Okay, so they're already fighting. They're already at war. It's not like, again, it's not this picture of Goliath coming out and it's this one-on-one. -on -one. David comes up, you know, he's, he, he flings his stone, knocks him dead, and then the Israelites conquer, and then they live happily ever after. They're at war with the Philistines while David is uh, going to his brothers. His brothers are terrified because they know that they're next. Um, Verse 18, take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousand. Uh, if your brothers are well, take some token for them. Uh, skipping down to verse 20, and David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. Okay, so now David physically hears Goliath calling out. Remember, he's been doing this for 40 days. Now David hears him and he can feel the fear of the Israelites. David's actually there, whereas before he's out in the fields. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget about um, how terrifying things are when you're not actually on the battle lines. David is now on the battle lines and he can hear Goliath shouting across this valley, taunting the Israelites. David's in the camp uh, bringing provisions to, to these, uh, these Israelites, some of his brothers included, who are at war with the Philistines and he can feel their fear. Verse 24, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard uh, when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. And you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward, an, uh, toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. So I think David's brother really thinks that David came down just to witness this war and to kind of stand off and, and watch this bloodshed. Uh, but certainly we know that that's not David's intent. David's intent is, why should we allow this man to defy the army of God? Uh, the army of God is sacred. God's people are sacred. Uh, God is a holy God. God is a just God. And we can't just stand by and, and live in fear and let this happen. So David's response isn't a pacifist approach where he's going to say, well, you know, we're supposed to pray for our enemies. And so, you know, I'm going to pray for the Philistines and, and just hope that God intervenes. Um, David takes a very active approach. He realizes the seriousness of it. Um, David has heard about the Philistines since he was born, and he knows how ruthless they are. Uh, verse 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, he repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. 
And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For he has defied, uh, defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Okay, I think um, theologically there's something that's pretty interesting about this. I talk a lot about uh, wolves and sheep and the response of shepherds and how shepherds are to be the protector of the flock. Uh, we see this all throughout the Bible. Here you have David, who was a shepherd by profession, a shepherd by, by trade, by profession. And David, from the time he was very young, was doing what with, uh, with the, the predators? Killing them with his bare hands. Um, now, certainly I'm not suggesting that when, uh, when wolves come into the flock, into the church, that, that we kill people. It's not at all what I'm suggesting, but I'm saying, I think this is really interesting theologically because, you know, the Bible describes people uh, in the scripture who are predators as wolves. Um, it doesn't, it's not describing their behavior, it's describing who they are. So people who come in and they ravage members of the church, um, they oppress them, they abuse them while pretending to be a sheep to get them in the process, those are described in Scripture as wolves. Uh, the biblical response is to grab them by their beard, by their fur, you know, what David was doing, and you get rid of them, you throw them out. Uh, you don't hug them. You don't, you know, get on the ground and wrestle and, you know, play fetch with wolves um, because that's not what they are. They're not dogs. They're wolves. Um, they're violent. Um, their intent, their instinct is to come in among the sheep, uh, to target certain sheep, and to go in for the kill, and they will kill them. Uh, so the biblical response it's not this pacifism where, you know, oh, you know, everybody's welcome in the church and we should pray for everybody and, you know, we should uh, give people second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and 15 chances. Uh, the Bible is pretty clear that we make distinctions and we instinctively know or should know whenever other people who are innocent are at risk. And so David has this, this, uh, this built-in instinct from being a shepherd that he knows when there's an enemy, he knows when there's a predator, he knows when there's somebody who's an oppressor, he knows when there's a wolf, he knows when there's a lion, he knows when they're about to attack, he knows whenever they're just uh, bearing their fangs and when they're actually going to attack. David knows this instinctively. So David's coming in, uh, given his background, I think it's pretty, <clears throat> pretty interesting that he's accustomed to killing uh, predators in order to spare the sheep. And so now this Philistine, uh, Goliath, has come out. He's issued this challenge. The whole military is already fighting with the Israelites. Uh, uh, Goliath has been coming out for 40 days, and he's, he's making these threats. And there's a very real threat. So the risk right now is that the wrong Israelite goes up against Goliath, loses the battle, and now the Israelites become slaves to the Philistines. That's what's at stake. You know, this is not some cute Bible story. Um, I always hear the Veggie Tales story in my head. Um, you know, the Veggie Tales story creates this cute little picture, you know, where David, David is like, we must help save Israel. You know, and then he goes up and, it, you know, it's like this cute little story. But the reality is everything was at stake. This was, this was either David wins the battle 
or the Israelites are wiped out. They are done. Uh, that's how much was at stake. So you can understand why his brother, David's brother, is livid with David. Um, because he's been fighting. You know, David's this little boy. Uh, David's older brother, him and his other brothers, uh, they've been fighting these wars. They know what it takes to win battles, and they know, uh, they know when they're going to lose battles. And they're all terrified in this moment. So when little David comes up and he starts asking questions within the military camp, uh, it's no wonder his brothers are mad at him. And they want him to just go away. So uh, I promised my kids that I, that I would uh, show these. So these came from Israel. Um, this is a, a sling like the one that David used. So it's just this little pouch. Uh, this was made by uh, shepherds. They have certificates of authenticity uh, that they were actually made in Israel. They were shipped over from Israel. Uh, they were made by Israelite shepherds. And uh, you can see there's not much to it. It's just a little, uh, it's a little pouch that's hand, handcrafted. And inside of this leather pouch, uh, which was one like what David would have carried, um, you have smooth stones. These also came from Israel. So I'm not going to launch this because um, it just would be bad. <laughs> but I just took the stone and put it inside of here. And you just grab it. Yeah, we have a broken window in the, in the back. So um, I'm going to be accused of practicing. We don't really know why there's a chunk of a window missing. It's a chunk about that big. And... Uh, I don't know, about two months ago, we just came in one morning and there was a piece of glass laying on the floor. And we had, nobody knows how it happened. Somebody knows how it happened. <laughs> Most of us don't know how it happened. Um, but David took one stone when he went up against this giant. And if you can imagine um, how scared he probably was, because he knew what was at stake. And he, he took it around and swung it, and then he released it, and the very first stone came, and it sunk into the forehead of Goliath. Down went Goliath, and then David, uh, in pretty gruesome fashion, then took the sword, and he cut Goliath's head off. Uh, it's a pretty violent picture, uh, but there's a reason for that. Uh, you know, David was sending a very strong message that uh, God, is, God is powerful, God is supreme, uh, God is bigger than the Philistine army. Uh, the Philistines aren't going to run around the world and keep intimidating people, um, and they've done it for long enough. And so David was saying that not only am I taking a stand, uh, Israel is taking a stand, and God is behind us. So, you know, if we can think about this today... Um, I mean, just think about how fearful we are, just generally. People generally are really fearful people. Uh, we look at what's going around with, uh, with this virus, too. Uh, people are scared. Uh, so many people are terrified. And statistically, you know, as long as people are smart and, and not spreading this thing around, um, statistically, very few people are, are, are going to wind up with this disease. There are right now just over one million people in the world uh, who've been confirmed with this virus. And look at how scared people are. Uh, now, I'm not making fun of people whatsoever. I, I think a lot of that fear is, um, a lot of the fear is justified. A lot of the fear is based on uh, past experiences with, uh, with health issues. And so I certainly am not poking fun at people. But I'm just saying, you know, human nature is to be fearful. And I think sometimes as Christians, um, we let that fear take hold in our lives, and it cripples us. Um, I, I heard this described the other day, which I thought was really cool. I'd never heard this term before, but uh, post-traumatic uh, growth. 
So we hear about post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, people all the time, I was diagnosed with PTSD, PTSD, and, and it's, it's rampant, rampant. Um, I wasn't planning this for this lesson, but if I were to look it up, if I were to look up PTSD and see how many people are diagnosed with this just in the United States, I'm guessing it's well into the millions. Uh, and so this, uh, this shift is talking about post-traumatic growth. Instead of letting traumas uh, define who you are and letting fear overtake you, um, you learn and you grow from the stress. Now, some of that's just personalities. Some people just have personalities where um, things that are really traumatic events in their lives, uh, you know, death, um, car accidents, uh, sickness, uh, chronic illness, you know, there are traumatic events that are truly, genuinely traumatic. Um, some people just have a personality where uh, they're going to take a David approach and they're just going to, they're going to step forward and they're, they're going to grow from it. And they're not going to let fear swallow them up. Uh, you have other people who just shut down and they completely shut down. Um, so I think as Christians, you know, it, it's really important for us to remember that uh, what's happening right now in the world is not unprecedented. Um, it's not anything new. It's not anything that the world hasn't experienced before. In fact, the world has experienced much worse. Uh, you know, they could have lived, or we could be living in times like what uh, Israel did when the Philistines were uh, bullying them. And basically, they were like what Syria is today. Uh, look at Syria, how ruthless they are to their own people. They are absolutely ruthless people. Cruel, inhumane, awful, awful human beings. Um, the leadership in Syria. And uh, people there are genuinely experiencing trauma. Uh, that's not perceived trauma. That's, I mean, that is genuine trauma that's going on in Syria. But you have some people from Syria who are, who are beautiful, beautiful people. And they're growing from that, and they're speaking out against the injustices. Um, so anyway, I, I, just, I think it's important that as Christians we remember that God is still God. Uh, as much as we struggle, God is powerful. God is with us. God hates injustices. Uh, God hates oppression. God doesn't want people like the Philistines. God doesn't want people like Syria to come in and to kill uh, mass numbers of people and to intimidate them. Uh, God wants us to take a stand against evil. Uh, we have one more slide that we're going to put up, and this guy is um, Robert Wadlow. So this will show you that uh, Goliath was not this freak of nature, uh, and it's not unprecedented. Robert Wadlow was born in 1918. Uh, he stood at a height of 8 feet 11.1 .1 inches, so he's just shy of 9 feet tall. Um, you can see him there, uh, how massive he is. And uh, he was big, he was powerful. Look at the size of his hands. Uh, his feet, you can't really see in this picture, but his feet were massive. Um, he was just a little bit shorter than what Goliath was. And uh, there are several people who are close to Robert Wadlow, uh, but he still wins the world record uh, for as long as we've been keeping records. He wins the record as of right now as the world's tallest person. Uh, he lived to the, to the age of 22. Um, I imagine he had health complications with uh, being so large, but just to give you a visual picture of about how big Goliath was, uh, and remember, Goliath was a, a warrior. Goliath was strong. He was powerful. Uh, he had been in, in the battlefields with the Philistines for many years. Um, there was a good reason why, why the Israelites were afraid of him. Uh, and then David came up against him, and keep in mind, he's wearing all this armor. Uh, David was not. David takes his sling. He launches it, and with one shot, he kills Goliath, and so spared the Israelites from being slaves to the Philistines. So, 
I'm going to uh, wrap it up there and uh, just thought that's pretty cool history. And, uh, you know, if you look at archaeology and, and the accounts that verify the Philistines and who they were, um, they definitely existed. They were around. Um, as I mentioned last week, we, we have this grave, uh, this big grave site in Ashkelon. And uh, it's pretty neat stuff. God is God, God is powerful, and God is on our side. Uh, remember that. We're going to have some songs here for the next uh, few minutes during the intermission, and then we'll pick back up at 11 o'clock.